Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, home of planning here in Solihull, room number one. Um, we haven't been here for some 20 months, but uh, traditionally this is where we've always held our planning committee meetings. Um, uh, it's my duty to welcome everybody uh, and read the following. Um, following the end of the initial COVID-19 legislation supporting virtual meetings, planning committee is now being held using a hybrid approach with all members of committee present in, the, in room number one. Where, where necessary or chosen to do so, officers and speakers are able to join the meeting courtesy of the WebEx IT system. This meeting is also being broadcast live on the Council's YouTube channel and the record will be archived for future viewing. Any member of the press and public who are unable to be here in person may listen to proceedings via this broadcast. The, partici the participants in this meeting will be the Council's concern, the officers advising the committee, and any members of the public or ward members registered to speak in the public speaking arrangements. Whereas the speakers will be able to address the meeting when invited to do so, either in person or remotely via the WebEx platform, when necessary, officers are able to read out the written statements submitted in advance by registered speakers. Supporting PowerPoint slides will be presented to members during the meeting where provided. As the chairman, I will use my discretion as to the order in which participants speak and will announce whom I wish to speak. May I remind officers and members participating this evening that during the meeting, all participants are in control of their own microphones and should keep them muted unless speaking. With regards to declarations, if a declaration is required after the meeting is started, this should be announced in the usual matter. With regard to voting, may I remind members of the committee that you are only allowed to participate in the vote if you've been present for the whole agenda item, including the officer's presentation and debate. Usual procedures rules apply to debate during the consideration of the agenda item, and I as chairman will have absolute discretion. If I as the chairman wish to adjourn the meeting at any point, I will announce the adjournment to inform you how long the adjournment will be. I can confirm that the uh, members present are myself, Councillor Bob Grinsall as Chairman, uh, Councillor Maggie Allen, Councillor Jim Butler, Councillor Steve Caldwell, Councillor Yvonne Clements, Ca Councillor David Cole, Councillor Stuart Davis, Vice Chairman, uh, Councillor Mike Goff and Councillor Jim Ryan. Um, Mr Acton, any apologies for absence, please? There are no apologies this evening, Chairman. Thank you. Any declarations of interest? No, thank you. Uh, requests of members to address the meeting. Just one this evening from Councillor Hogarth on the application uh, 20210313, which is 7 Newfield Close, Solihull. Thank you. Um, questions and deputations? None received. Thank you. Um, planning, planning Committee forward, which is for noting. Uh, so we move on to item six, which is the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, I see nods. Can I have uh, a recommendation for Councillor Goff and seconded? Councillor Davis, thank you. Solihull Local Plan Policies, uh, again for noting. So we move on to uh, the first substantive item on our agenda this evening, which is uh, 56 Load Lane, pages 13 to 18. Uh, John, over to you. Thank you, Chair. So full planning permission is sought for the change of use of an existing guest house to an eight bedroomed house of multiple occupation. So if I can just run through the drawings, we'll get the uh, PowerPoint presentation up. Next slide, when you're ready, please. 
Here we go. So this shows the location of the site. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see it's to the uh, the east of uh, Load Lane, and it's at the end of Load Lane, fairly close to the hospital. Uh, you can see a um, few properties down the circular building there. That's a uh, a doctor surgery health centre. Um, it, it is one half of a pair of semi detached properties. Currently, it's used as a, uh, a guest house. The adjoining half of the pair of semis is a residential care home. It's known as St. Basil's and it provides accommodation. Well, it's got 12 bedrooms in there and provides accommodation for people between the age of 16 to 24. And there are um, an equivalent of uh, two and a half staff members present in that building. Uh, next slide, please. This just zooms in again, shows you, uh, what it, it says hotel, technically it's not a hotel, it's St. Basil's next door. And then number 56 is the application site. Next slide, please. Now this shows the existing ground floor, um, internal configuration of the property arranged over three floors. Next slide, please. This shows you as proposed. Now there are only very minor alterations to the property um, to convert it to the proposed HMO from the guest house. All works are purely internal. There's no external works whatsoever. So the appearance of the property will not change at all. Neither will any external areas such as car parking or, or amenity areas, etc. Next slide, please. Now, uh, these are photographs of the building. The, uh, the half of the semi in question is the one right in the center with the, uh, the blue painting. That's the guest house. Um, St. Basil's, the adjoining half is to the left. The property to the right that's non attached is a dwelling house. In terms of um, the, uh, the accessibility of the site, um, as I've said, it's uh, at the end of Load Lane, close to uh, the uh, sort of more commercial facilities on the edge of the town. And directly outside of the site there, you can see uh, an existing bus stop. So it's certainly very well served. And the entire frontage is hard surface. So it's a car park at present that will remain unchanged. Next slide, please. Uh, the application site is the property to the left. The pair of semis to the right are the adjacent properties and they are in residential uses. Next slide, please. Again, another uh, view of the same uh, pair of semis with a bus stop in front. Next slide, please. This is a view looking down Load Lane to Seven Stars Road. Next slide, please. And this is a view of Load Lane to Grove Road and Solly Hill Hospital looking back in the direction of the town. And that's the end of the slideshow. So the key issues relevant to the assessment and determination of this application are explored in detail in the main report and the recommendation as set out in the report is one of approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. Um, we have one speaker and uh, one statement to be read out. Um, Louise McCabe. Uh, Ms. McCabe, you have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Louise McCabe and I'm a resident living directly opposite the application site. I speak on behalf of my family and all of my neighbours who have lodged an objection. I'm a novice at this, so please bear with me. My family and I have lived at this location for almost 25 years and have direct experience of the issues that already exist around access, highway safety, and disturbance and antisocial behaviour. Adjacent to the application site is Milden Halls, which is operated by St Basil's as a facility for accommodating young adults making the transition from care to independent living. We as neighbours are all exceptionally supportive of St Basil's and while St Basil's generally manage their facility well, they still on occasions experience antisocial behaviour which impact upon amenity. As a result, having that direct experience, we do have strong reservations and concerns around the cumulative impact arising from the current situation and an increase in authorised people from four to eight sought through this planning application. We are concerned about noise disturbance, comings and goings, highways impact on a stretch of road which is on a day-to-day -day basis 
fraught with difficulties in terms of getting off driveways safely and the unacceptable cumulative impact in this location. Photographs taken at 8.26am yesterday morning presented to the committee show the issue to, relating to parking at 30. In this particular example, I believe the photos will be shown to you at your leisure, at least one vehicle will have to exit the driveway reversing into oncoming traffic to a main arterial route into Solihull Town Centre, which is a red route and also a bus lane at a junction with the immediate, within the immediate vicinity of a bus stop at a point where the road starts to narrow. It is our understanding as neighbours that the application is made by an elected landlord who will not be living on site. Across the country, many HMOs are presenting local communities with issues. The existence of Mildon Hall House next door potentially compounds matters as safeguarding is brought into the potential equation. In all circumstances, we do not consider that an increase in the number of people can be accommodated satisfactorily within this HMO, and this cannot happen without causing an adverse impact on the quality of life of those living in the location. I would therefore request that the committee look to refuse consent, and I thank you very much for affording me the time to address the committee this evening. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Ms McCabe, and uh, there was absolutely no need for you to discuss in any way, shape or form the presentation. Um, the, uh, Mr Acton, we have a, a, a statement to be read out from uh, Mr Ranjit Singh, is that correct? That is Chairman. A uh, statement from Ranjit Singh says, I purchased this property and would have liked for it to be continued to be used as a guest house. However, in light of the recent pandemic and the previous owner's advice, the business would have struggled to survive. Looking at all the options, we felt that it would best serve as an eight-bed HMO, aimed to accommodate working professionals in the local area. The balance between room and bathrooms accommodate perfectly to suit people that will appreciate a comfortable living environment. It offers four to five car parking spaces and a garage, with ample space to provide space for motorcycle and bicycles. Also, with bus stops on the doorstep, serving transport to a variety of areas and a local train station, it will attract and accommodate public transport users. It is also aimed to provide affordable living to local working people, such as the hospital and touchwood workers and the growing office worker sector community, especially as many flats in the area are unaffordable for single working people with low paid jobs. I feel it will provide a valuable service to local working people and people looking to relocate into Solihull. Hall. I'd also add that the variation from a seven bed guest house to an eight bed HMO is very minimal would cause minimum impact on its surrounding. As a professional landlord being part of MLIS and NLIA, which are well recognised bodies within the letting industry, I take great pride in my profession and aim to provide a high quality service. I hope that this supports my application on reassuring local residents that the type of people accommodating the property will be of a good nature. And that ends the statement from Mr Ranjit Singh. Thank you, Mr Acton. Um, John, the photographs that uh, um, Ms McCabe referred to before I start the debate, can I uh, ask those to be shown, please? Thank you very much. Uh, I thought it was important that we all got to view this uh, in fairness to me. Um, right. Uh, it's my responsibility to start the debate. The council standing orders require me to move the motion. Though I'm moving the motion, I'm still undecided on how I will vote. Uh, do I have a second, please? Councillor Davies, thank you very much indeed. Members, um, start the debate. Councillor Ryan, that's not your normal position in debating, but uh, more than happy to hear from you. Welcome back to this lovely room. 
Very nice. Um, the letter has just been read out. Puts forward the notion that you want to turn it from a guest house to a HMO to accommodate working professionals and working people in the area. That being the case, I thought a guest house would be adequate for that rather than a HMO. The HMOs that I know, and I do know them and I visit them, are for people who are in the main troubled in one way or another. Uh, they're placed by social mm -hmm. services or youth offending or something like that. So they have a multiplicity of needs, like the young people that's stopping at St. Basil's have a great deal of need as well and support. Now, I don't like to see homeless people, and I don't like to see people walking the streets with a blanket. I don't like it. And I do my best wherever I can to help as much as possible homeless people. It's a stain on all of us, homelessness. There's too much of it. HMOs can provide a service of need. But the HMOs need to be managed and that support needs to be embedded within a HMO so that the people who are staying there get the support that is necessary for them to eventually move on, hopefully into employment, into training or onto an apprenticeship or whatever. And we we tend to be putting the cart before the horse here because uh, we're asking for a management plan. That management plan should have been encouraged to come with the application so that we would be able to view the management plan, read it, assess it, to see if it's going to do the job that you would want it to do. And I take very seriously the views of the local resident who spoke uh, very well indeed, articulates it there concerns and I think we have a duty to listen to those concerns so I'm in I'm in this balanced situation at the moment yearning for more information how it's going to be managed it is said that um, I don't know how true it is but I would be asking for advice on this that they will be on their own within that building that there is no one on site to actually manage it so I need, we need to know that about it. If, if those uh, vulnerable, uh, troubled people were on their own in, in a building, uh, without that support and management, I, I think it can become very, very uh, not, not, good, not a good place for the, for the residents of this HMO who need that support. Now I'm speaking not as someone who doesn't know HMOs, I do. And I visit them, so I do know them. And I'm speaking from, with some authority on the subject. And I must impress more for us to listen very carefully to the resident, and also be asking for the management plan, why it wasn't produced with the application. And it doesn't ring true to me. Maybe I'm not questioning it. it's, it's, it's in any way being deceitful, but the letter doesn't ring, tr ring true in one sense where you can say, I've got a guest house, but I need to hedge them all to, it, to attract working professionals. That doesn't ring, ring out to me with, with very well, but I need more clarification on that, Chairman. And um, I will re reserve my judgment as to whether or not I can put my name to it. Thank you, Chairman. Did any officer wish to respond to uh, Councillor Ryan? 
certainly can, Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, the um, management scheme is proposed to be dealt with by condition. Um, in terms of how it's implemented and run, provided it is agreed, submitted, agreed, and in place prior to the use commencing, um, it doesn't matter if it's submitted with the application or post at condition. It isn't something that we think isn't going to be achievable and that has to be looked at so um, closely in advance of any decision being made. There will be um, a way of managing this that we're satisfied with. And if the, at the discharge of condition stage information is submitted to us that we're not happy with, we simply will not approve that scheme and the use will not be able to commence until they've submitted something that we're happy with um, that will then be implemented as and when. But something else I want to point out as well, I think it's wrong to say that HMOs are for, HMOs are for troubled people with a multiplicity of needs. I've certainly lived in an HMO in the past and I wouldn't call myself to be troubled with a multiplicity of needs. But in terms of the um, management plan, it's quite usual to deal with it by condition, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cole. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. I basically agree with what Councillor Ryan said. When residents find that they've got uh, an HMO being planned where they live, they go up in despair. I know, I've seen it. When they run well, they're an asset to the community and somewhere for people to live. When they run poorly, they become a blot on the landscape. And this helps no one, it doesn't help the residents, it doesn't help the people who live there. We must make sure that you know these HMOs are properly run and properly vetted and properly looked after. It needs a management plan and I, I think it should have been a condition of it. There are too many HMOs, in my opinion, that are being run poorly and give the sector a bad name. So um, I'm undecided on which way I'm, I'm going to vote on this. Um, I'd like to hear what other members have got to say. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cole. Just to say that there is a condition for a saying, should we advance, <coughs> excuse me, have to officers to decide whether the management plan um, adequate or, or robust enough. Councillor Goff. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I've got a few questions uh, for officers, really. It's regarding um, the current, basically the fallback position, you know, with regard to the current use, because, you know, if we were looking at a residential property uh, being converted to, converted to a HMO, I would have a, a totally different view. But the fact is, it's already a guest house. So, you know, I would think that a guest house would potentially have more impact with the comings of, uh, you know, different people on a regular basis. But... Uh, I'd be interested to know uh, the situation with regard to regulation. Uh, you know, is the HMO a much lighter touch with regard to regulation than the guest house, or is that not the case? John, over to you. I know the answer, but over to you. When you say regulation, in, what sort of regulation do you mean, Councillor? Is there any oversight uh, by the local authority to a guest house or a HMO? I'm just thinking, you know, from a resident's situation would impact? Well, HMOs certainly, this is outside of the planning system, they have to be licensed, um, but what that process entails and how they're then monitored and managed as a result of that, I, I really couldn't advise, but there is a licensing process that exists. Councillor Butler. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it, my question is, is in relation to the licensing issue, but I think it overlaps slightly, uh, sort of <laughs> the cringe, <laughs> um, simply because the, 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 I've just been reading about the, 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 the licensing requirements regarding the space available, that there is a certain uh, space requirement um, 
are, are we meeting? And, and that change is dependent upon whether it's a single office permit, it's a couple, so on and so forth. Now, the applicant has said you know, that the, the, they will be um, you know, vetted people or whatever. I can't remember the exact words that he used. Um, how, are we sure that, that, that the space requirements meet what the applicant is, is, is asking for, if that makes sense? Uh, it does make sense. Fully understand what you're saying. Um, the simple answer to that is I don't know because the control of room size, etc., as part of the licensing process, is a different process to planning. So, if planning permission were to be granted for this, it wouldn't then override the separate licensing process. They would still need to make sure that they were fully compliant with the requirements of that. And the fact that that planning permission had been granted, if it is indeed granted, wouldn't then impact at all. On the on the licensing assessment, it's two separate matters. Thank you, John. Uh, I'll come to you in a second, Councillor Dave. I just really want to ask the committee if. If if they had had sight of the tenancy management scheme that alleviate some of the issues, I can see a couple of nods, three nods, four nods, five nods. Okay, so uh, it's not my place. So before I, well, no, I'll suggest something that perhaps. Be someone could consider deferring the item so that we do have a view of that in order to make a the necessary decision. Um, but before, whilst people are considering that, I'll go to Councillor Davis and then I'll come to you, Councillor Caldwell. Chairman. Saying that we would have approved had there been this management plan, of course, depends what's in the management plan. So we, we don't know. And therefore, as Councillor Ryan's already elucidated to, that is something we should uh, perhaps see. Um, this is a bed and breakfast guest house. What actually will be the difference to the services provided inside if a guest house becomes an HMO? For instance, guest house usually provides breakfast, does an HMO? HMOs are just people living together um, with an element of shared facilities. So, no, there'd be no sort of cooked uh, continental breakfasts, etc. It would just be people, you know, looking after themselves and, and living normally. As you would expect. Uh, thank you for that. And obviously, you're the voice of experience on this. Um, how many bedrooms are there at the moment? A seven. Seven. So it's going to put an extra, an extra bedroom, one more bedroom in. Thank you, Chairman. As a call well. Yes, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to clarify something about the condition for the tenancy management scheme. Is that in fact a planning consideration because we've just spoken about licensing and how that would need to be a separate consideration to whether planning was granted for the changes that we're making to the property but i'm i don't know i'm slightly puzzled that we're talking about how in order to get that hmo status and there's a licensing consideration that needs to take place i would have thought i've got a little bit of experience in property management that that tenancy management scheme would be a licensing consideration primarily a planning consideration so i'm just confused by that if that could be clarified that'd be great yeah i think you make a fair point and i think they do overlap and and the link perhaps could be a little bit tenuous um to be attaching this to a planning permission but i think the link is substantial enough when you think that one of the key considerations with any planning application is any potential harm to amenity, which could be through noise, nuisance, etc. So this sort of condition would look to address and, and prohibit any uh, undue amounts of disturbance, etc. Yes, sir, Ryan. 
I, I'd, I'd like to move deferment of this application so that we have sight of the management plan. The reason I'm saying that is that I want it to work. And I want it to work in such a way. Oh, sorry. Councillor Davis, can you mute your microphone, please? Thank you, Chairman. I, I, I want it to work. And the only way I can see it working with longevity um, for the people that it wants to accommodate is that it has a management plan and we need to see sight of it and that it stands up to a reasonable, a reasonable amount of rigor. I'm talking about reasonable amount of rigor that we can see then how it's going to be managed. And I think the residents would, would, uh, would obviously like to see that so they have access to that plan. And uh, I think that would help all of us, and it would help me to be able to come to a decision, to be able to support it if uh, if the management plan stands up to scrutiny. So I'd move that, Chairman. That's the... Thank you, Councillor Ryan. Can you now mute your microphone as the call comes in? <laughs> Have you muted it, Jim? <laughs> Could I second that, please, Chair? Certainly. Bear with me a moment. Okay, we have um, uh, proposed and seconded a motion for deferral of this item in order to uh, for us to view the management plan uh, to be put before us. So therefore, I'm going to put that to the vote. Uh, those in favour of deferral. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Unanimous, Chairman. Thank you. That's deferred uh, to a future item. Thank you very much indeed. It, it will be published on the um, website, I assume. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. It'll be published on the website. Yes, correct, yeah. Okay, thank you very much indeed. We move on to the next item, which is uh, 140 Nights Ridge Road on page 25 to 30 of your papers. Uh, there are no speakers on this. Um, members, uh, who's going to present it? Becky, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Planning permission is sought for the erection of a single storey side and rear extension at 140 Knightsbridge Road. The proposed extension is considered to be of a suitable scale and design in relation to the host property and will not have a detrimental impact on the neighbouring amenities of the application site. As such, the extension would be in accordance with policies P14 and P15 of the Solihull Local Plan and the House Extension Guidelines SPD, and therefore the recommendation is one of approval. Just very quickly take you through the slides. Could we have some? This is the application site outlined in red. Next slide, please. It shows where the extension's going. You just see the outline very, very faded there. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is the existing elevations of the property and the existing floor plan. And here you can see um, the new side extension and rear extension. Uh, single story, flat roof. Yep, next slide. This is the front of the property. Next. Uh, here you can see the garage. Uh, there's existing two side facing windows there. That's altering, but there's no um, further extension in terms of its footprint. Next slide, please. And this is the rear of the property. You can see that next door's already got an existing single story rear extension. Um, as set out in the report, the recommendation. Thank you, Becky. Um, it is my, there's no speaker, so therefore it's my responsibility to start the debate. Council standing orders require me to move the motion, although I move the motion, I'm still on this side and how I'll second that. Uh, members, as you know, we are obliged to see these applications because the applicant is a senior officer. 
council um personally i can't see any reason to debate uh, to move straight to the vote but if people do wish to debate please do yes uh, i noticed that the 45 degree line is breached by 2.5 meters which is quite substantial can you explain that one to me becky yeah of course i mean yes it is breached by 2.5 meters um because it's a flat roof extension, it's considered that that wouldn't result in a detrimental impact on the neighbouring amenity. And I would point out that any extension that was built on the rear of that property over for the point where it breaches, which I think I guess is probably at about 2.5 metres, um, would result in a breach of the 45 degree line. So they could, under permitted development, put a three metre extension there that would breach it. Um, but at a breach of 2.5 metres for a single storey flat roof extension of this height, it's not considered to have a detrimental impact. And I think it's set out in the report, but if you look at the path of the sun throughout the day, any overshadowing that could occur would only be very late in the evening. Well, the fact that it's a flat roof. Thank you, Chairman. Shall we move to the vote, therefore? Um, Recommendation is one of approval. Those in favour? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Unanimous, Chairman. Thank you. That's approved. Uh, we now move on to a not dissimilar scenario in that uh, we get the application of 20 Coton Grove on pages 37 to 42. Uh, is that you again, Becky? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. This application seeks planning permission for the enlargement of a single storey rear extension and a change to the roof configuration. The proposed extension and alterations would result in a single storey rear extension of a flat roof design with a lantern roof light in place of the existing smaller single storey pitched roof extension. The proposed extension is considered to be of a suitable scale and design in relation to the host property and as such would not have a detrimental impact on neighbouring amenities to the application site. As such, the extension would be in accordance with policies P4 P15 of the Solihull Local Extension Guidelines FPD, and therefore the recommendation is one of them. Let's go through the slide. Uh, so this is the application site outlined in red. On the right-hand side, you can see um, the existing pitched roof single-storey rear extension. The top left shows you the proposed footprint. So it's um, not increased in depth, but it is increased in width to cover the full width of the property. It's a flat roof design with a lantern roof light. Yeah, next slide. That just shows it again in a little bit more detail. Next slide, please. This shows you the existing elevation. So if you look at the bottom left hand, that's the rear existing rear elevation with the pitch line. Next slide, please. And the bottom left again it shows you the extension to that existing single storey extension and the erection of a flat roof and lantern roof light. Next slide, please. And this is just a 3D image to show you it in a bit more detail. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, this is the existing rear elevation, so you can see that pitched roof design on the single storey extension, and it's the element to the right of that that's being filled in, flat roof, lantern roof light. Next slide. And this just shows you an aerial photograph um, of the extension site, and you can see its relationship with the neighbours, which we're satisfied they wouldn't be and as set out in the report, it's a recommendation of approval. Thank you, Becky. Um, it's my responsibility to start the debate. The council standing orders require me to move the motion. Although I'm moving the motion, I'm still undecided on how I'll vote. Do I have a second there? Thank you. Uh, again, we have a, an application from a senior officer of the council. Um, I'm happy to debate it. Alternatively, can we move straight to the seems no debate, therefore, uh, uh, the, the application recommendation is approval subject to conditions. Those in favour? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Unanimous, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to the next item, which is an application at Newfield Close on pages 63 to 68 of our uh, agenda. Um, 
is that you? Yes, again, Becky. Love you. Carry on, please. Uh, yes, that's the order. We Did we have the speakers first? No, we don't. We had the, your brief first. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. This application seeks full planning permission for the erection of a single detached dwelling on land adjacent to seven new fields. The principle of this residential development is policy compliance, creating one additional residential unit in an established accessible residential area contribute towards meeting an identified need for smaller residential units within the borough. The principle of the development is acceptable and in compliance with policy P5 of the Solid Hole Local Plan. It's considered that the design and layout of the proposed new dwelling is acceptable and the proposal is therefore in accordance with policy 15 of the Solid Hole Local Plan. In terms of other material considerations pertinent to the determination of this application, subject to conditions your officers have concluded that the proposed development is acceptable other aspects, namely the community, highways, landscape and ecology. Just draw members' attention to um, the update note, which includes some additional conditions in relation to drainage. There's two drainage conditions, a condition which would seek the side-facing landing window to be obscurely glazed, um, a in relation to uh, works on site and all existing trees and hedges, large rubs, except those agreed for removal, protected by barriers. That includes the TPO tree at the rear of the site. And there's also the deletion of condition seven and the replacement with a condition which relates to the provision of suitable nesting boxes. In addition to that, there's a note to encourage the applicant to install EV charging points. And there's also an amendment to the report on page 52, paragraph three, um, it isn't for five dwellings, it is for a single detached dwelling. I'll take you through the slides. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the application site um, in red, and you can see the footprint of the proposed new dwelling in blue with two parking spaces to the frontage. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the proposed elevation to the property. You'll see it's a relatively flat fronted. It's just got a small porch projection to it, um, which is in keeping with the street scene. Um, and gable bends, again, in keeping with the street scene. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows you the proposed ground floor plan. You'll note that there's no breach of the 45 degree line taken from the, the rear of number seven, Newfield, which would sit to the north. Next slide, please. This is the proposed first floor plan. Again, there would be no breach from the first floor windows at number seven. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the proposed street scene. So number seven, Newfield Close, sits to the left. That's the uh, right-hand side of the pair of semi-detached properties. Then there would be the proposed new detached dwelling. And then on the right-hand side is what is considered to be anomaly within the street scene, number nine, which is a detached property, but is not of the same character as any of the other ones in Newfield. Next slide, please. Okay, so throughout the lifetime of the application, there has been a number of... Um, iterations of the design. The top left was what was initially submitted and um, we don't have a street scene drawing of that but that was significantly higher than the properties along um, Newfield Close, in particular the pair of semi-detached at number five and number seven. Um, then the bottom right is the first set of amendments which came in as a result of requesting a redu reduction in the height um, but it was considered that that was poor design as a result of that very shallow roof slope. Next slide please. Um, and then the top left um, is essentially what you can see before you now, except this included um, a setback at the first floor. So it looked like there was a single storey rear extension on the property. That's been altered now to the final scheme, which is the bottom right, um, where the ground floor and first floor run in line with each other. Next slide, please. And here you can see the application site, which is situated in between number seven Newfield Close on the left and number nine Newfield Close on the right. Next slide, please. Okay, this is taken from the rear of number seven, and you can see the parcel of land there where the new dwelling would be built. Next slide, please. This is the side elevation of number seven Newfield Close. Next slide, please. Uh, this is taken uh, looking into the site. So again, the new dwelling would be situated on that parcel of land. Um, and in the rear, see the TPO tree. Next slide, please. This is the frontage of the site, so access would be gained over that existing lawn area and that hedge would be removed. Next slide, please. 
and this is a view down Newfield Close, uh, the application sites at the far end. You can see the TPO tree in the distance on the left-hand side, and you can see the existing character of properties on Newfield Close, which are gable-ended, semi-detached properties. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Becky. Um, we have one statement to be read out and uh, then two representations. Uh, the statement is from Mr. Otterwell, correct? Thank you, Chairman. A statement from Mr. Otterwell reads, having read the report of the proposed dwelling stating that the design and layout will respect and enhance the character of the local area in accordance with policy paragraphs 15 of SLP, and despite various consultees have raised no objection, we can only reiterate our objections to the proposed development. The subjective word enhancing is used frequently throughout SLP and NPPF to relate to the character of an area, but we believe the removal of a more soft landscaping and light would be ecologically damaging, not enhancing in this development, and could affect biodiversity. Where page 54, paragraph 4 of the report claims the proposal building design enhances its surroundings, by what standard or criteria has this been decided? Newfield Close was originally an open plan development with lawn frontages between driveways. As freeholds were bought and covenants removed, most residents created gardens around their lawns, thus encouraging more diverse wildlife. Most residences retain this soft landscaping. Consequently, the proposed development will affect the wildlife corridor of the resident fox families which play on the frontages and in the rear gardens, including number seven. More importantly, the development will affect the wildlife corridor of the bats. They use the gap where the dwelling is proposed between seven and nine to access the back gardens of the opposite dwellings and have done for more than 50 years. Since storm runoff from number seven and the end of the cul-de-sac collects on the highway, pavement and at the end of driveway to number 12, which is lower land, the proposed hard landscaping for parking in front of the proposed dwelling will exacerbate this problem. We believe the proposed dwelling will greatly obstruct natural light and sunlight to numbers 16 and 14, because from the October equinox to May, the low sun only reaches those properties through the gap where the dwelling will be sited. Has a 25 degree line, BRE guidelines and AHSP, been taken to ascertain any detrimental effect. It is not mentioned in the report. Concerns have been raised about the effect of building above the root system of the sycamore tree in the adjacent garden, which is subject to a TPO in view of the RHS research on large mature trees. Whilst acknowledging Solhill's need for more local housing, planning for this proposed dwelling seems to ignore any ecological considerations, raising concerns for future permitted development especially when noting the nearby development at 22 Cornex Lane. And that ends this statement of Mr. Rockwell. Thank you, Mr. Acton. Um, the, uh, next is uh, Mr. Perdue. Perdue, once you're settled, you have three minutes. Hi, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, regarding the ecological uh, part of that, I've lived in that property since I was 14 years old. Uh, as a family home, uh, there's never been any uh, fox life that I'm aware of or, or any problems with any bats. Um, the proposal, the purpose of the development is that I want to live next to my disabled mother who lives at number seven. Um, she's 90 years old and at the moment she's disabled and uh, blind. Um, so a house that stored it helped me to look after my mother and it would remove the need of home care at the expense of local government. Uh, moreover, it's, it's in the government's interest to build you know, more houses uh, to meet housing stock. As I say, I'm a local man. I was raised in Newfield Close, going to Lytle School. I moved to Shirley as an adult, um, but the only way I could really afford to live next door to my mother uh, to help her is, is to have a uh, self-build. Um, the size of the building has been reduced substantially to meet any concerns from the council and this committee and 45 degree angles have been put in place. Um, 
that's um, the parking uh, on the street um, there's two spaces provided which is more than the 1.6 um, that required um, and now all overlooking windows which is the one face of my mother's would be frosted then the neighbors at number nine have made substantial extensions to their property um, and it hasn't had any impact on any wildlife or the trees or anything else um, so I, I think you know we, it shouldn't infringe on the neighbors rights sort of to develop my property um, I have sort of listed if you wish to you know um, addressing any neighbors concerns um, I don't think there's time to go through all them now at the three minutes uh, but I would just like to say that you know it's it's an area I love uh, been brought up and I will respect it okay thank you thank you very much uh, final speaker on this one is uh, Councillor Hogarth uh, you'd vacate that uh, seat thank you Mr Perdue Councillor Hogarth I'm sure you're very much aware you do have four minutes Mr Chairman, thank you and members for allowing me to address you this evening. Before I make any reasons why the, uh, this should be rejected, it does make it rather difficult when we have the applicant here in, as well, and I tend to represent all electors in the borough, to be perfectly honest. However, the reason I ask for this application to be called in is because there are just 14 houses in Newfield Close the application to erect a detached house has caused the neighbours to be deeply concerned at the proposal before you. Next to the, to the proposed site is a very unusual but I consider very attractive cottage that has been tastefully extended in the past and to have a house built in the small plot of land next to the cottage would not in my mind be in keeping with the present street scene and I believe it unlikely to comply with our policy P15. This afternoon I went to have a look at the uh, sycamore tree which is on the grounds or very close to this plot and it's a massive tree with a protection order and at the moment it's in full leaf. However, I do feel that any excavation of that site will damage the roots of this tree could be very much disturbed by any groundwork and that there would be a possibility of either major surgery or the felling of the tree. And as you've seen on the pictures uh, shown to you this evening, it's a very impressive uh, and uh, superb uh, specimen. There are concerns of the possibility of neighbours being overlooked and many additional concerns have been highlighted in correspondence to our officers. The access is 3.1 metres and parking for two vehicles. The road has all day parking restrictions. I fully realise that to have an additional property added to the number required by the council is welcome, but not to the de detriment of existing residents and especially in this case. Therefore, I ask you to refuse. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Hogarth. Um, it's my responsibility to start the debate. The Council's standing orders require me to move the motion. I am moving the motion. I'm still undecided on how I will vote. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Davis. Uh, members, um, <clears throat> I did visit the site. I have to say that the I agree with Councillor Hogarth that that particular tree I'm sure you've all been down there to view it. He, he's an absolute magnificent uh, specimen. One of the finest I'm seeing, frankly. Um, however, um, <clears throat> our officers have uh, suggested that there's really concern about that. That's for us to decide as decision makers. And when I and, and I do have concerns, and, and, and I will wait until I hear my fellow members uh, 
debate it because I'm sure they will. Um, but um, <clears throat> the phrase came to mind immediately, I suppose, when I viewed it, it was a quart into a pint pot. Uh, but on reflection, uh, uh, I'd rather say a pint into a shot glass is more appropriate in this particular instance. So, members, who would like to start the debate? Councillor Goff, thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I likewise uh, visited the site today. And, um, as, as members uh, probably know, generally I'm quite favourable when it comes to infill properties and do there is a need for housing and I do appreciate uh, the applicant's uh, situation. However, you know, some sites lend themselves to uh, infill development better than others. So, you know, I, I have to say with hand on heart, this isn't one of those sites. Uh, you know, I, the chairman just said there, it really is squeezing a, into a court or a shot glass, whichever the case may be. It, it's, it's a very small parcel of land uh, between the two houses of something somewhere I imagine there this house being built to how small it is so uh, I'll uh, listen with intent to what other members have to say before I make up my mind but uh, that's all I'd like to say for now thank you Chair Councillor Caldwell thank you thank you Chair I, I'm, I'm minded to agree I mean for me this it's difficult because I understand the reasons why the applicant wants to build property. Um, but on the face of it, on the application that's in front of us, I don't see how it's compatible with P15. I just don't. Um, I think that the fact that there is such a tiny access to the rear um, space on the property, I think it's 326 millimetres. I don't see how that that works as a, as a housing development. I think the, the front... With the um, with the driveway as it is designed with those two cars, I'm looking at that. I don't I don't see how that works. I don't see how that's a quality development. And again, I mean, I, I as as Councillor Goff, I'd be happy to hear arguments the other way. But for me, I am also very concerned about in front of us. Thank you, Councillor Corbyn. I, I must admit, when we saw those photographs this evening. like a house on a lawn. <laughs> uh, Councillor Allen. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. It's uh, massively, going to be massively overcrowded. And um, I do wonder, I, I'm probably being a little bit um, uh, cheeky here, <laughs> but, um, and, and I do appreciate and understand the applicant's uh, um, uh, uh, problems um but would it not have been better to have um extended his mother's house rather than building on that little plot of land i don't know whether that was ever anything that uh, he could think about that's it really he can now cancel i know that you've stated it um <laughs> uh yeah i, I I, I'm starting to think, I'll come to you in a second, Councillor David. Um, the, 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 for me, there's always been three issues. The tree, the access, uh, and I, I, I have to comment, uh, because as Councillor Hogarth mentioned, and it's in our papers, it's 3.1 metres opening, and they're going to have to get rid of shrubs to, to do that but I'm looking at Councillor Ram because I think he's been on this planning committee longer than the majority um, because we have on page 55 it is unlikely that vehicles will be able to turn within the application site therefore vehicles would have to reverse on the driveway have you ever seen that before Councillor Ram? no and that's how many, how many years experience 24. Good question, and I'm always very pleased to answer. 
and I've probably been on the council now 42 years and on planning committee for 35 of those 42 years. But I'm always learning and I'm, I'm, still, I'm still faced with surprising aspects of reports and that keeps me alive and keeps me energized. And I agree, I agree with you, Chairman. And uh, you know, I now as I'm speaking, I, I do admire the, the applicant for his ambition and uh, in trying to do and look forward to the future in terms of his family. But I think th this is cramming uh, the, at the worst type of cramming that I have seen in recent times anyway. And I think uh, it deserves better than the cramming that we have in that little close. And uh, that's why, Chairman, I have come down on the on the side of not supporting the application. I do I feel sorry about that, but that's where I am. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Ryan. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Chairman. It's uh, often difficult to follow Councillor Ryan, who elucidates these, uh, these points very succinctly. I too have sympathy with the applicant who's trying to do the best for his mother. Um, but we have to look, as I'm sure he's gathered already, the, the, the wider picture. I was going to use the uh, GU use chairman, which was the court and the pint part, but I would bring committee up to date and say we should really know what that is in metric now, shouldn't we? The tree, of course, uh, can be protected by adequate root protection that's um, available these days, and I know the officers will, will know what they would want to, to do there. Um, but it also, to me, it, it breaks the natural, the natural rhythm of the street scene. Um, these appear to be large-ish uh, semi-detached properties um, and when you look round, even the cottage at the end, you don't really see it until you're on top of it. And then back up the other side. Uh, and this would, I think, it would be, uh, yes, it would be alien to the street scene. And, and that's where I'm going to come from. Also, it's, it's not very wide. It's just over five metres wide. Uh, which is like getting my eldest son to lie down two and a half times. Um, so it isn't really very wide. Um, and I don't think this probably would be in line with policy 15, P15. Thank you, Councillor Davis. So, uh, did you want to interject, Councillor Caldwell? I was, I was only going to clarify for Councillor Davis that it would be 1136 millilitres into a 568 millilitre pot. Can you say that in Latin? Can that be minuted, please, so that we know for the future? No, I'm only teasing. Um, okay, I, I, I think we know where we're going with this. So um, I'm going to move to the vote uh, for this application, which is one of approval. Those in favour of approval. No be in favour, Chairman. Members, therefore, we're looking at uh, maybe refusal. Can I uh, suggest that we do talk refusal uh, uh, against policy P15, which, uh, and specifically P15-1, um, uh, which reads, conserves and enhances local character, distinctiveness and streetscape quality, and ensures that the scale, massing, density, layout, materials and landscape of the development respect the surrounding nature, uh, build, build and historic environment. That's uh, what I'm proposing if you're... So uh, those in favour of refusal based on policy P15, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, unanimous, Chairman. Thank you. Um, that uh, application is therefore refused. Thank you, members. Uh, we can I assume that uh, 
So, sorry, Mark. Would I? Th I think you've got them. I've said P fifteen. I've read the the part of it that it contravenes. We're all agreed on that. So I'm happy for not to have to see that subsequently. Thank you. Um, but thank you for bringing it to my attention. So, therefore, members, we move on to item 16 uh, on our agenda, which is Hobsmoke United, United Reformed Church on pages 69 to 86. Uh, is that you, John? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Full planning permission is sought for the demolition of the existing church buildings on the site and the erection of seven dwellings comprising of three pairs of semi-detached houses and one detached property. So if I can just now run through the submitted drawings. Next slide, please. This shows the site. You can see it sits within a suburban, fairly high density residential area of the town. Um, and within that context, um, the site at the moment doesn't relate well to the general pattern of development. It's characterized by um, pairs of semi-detached houses generally or rows of small rows of terrace properties and within that context you have the the church building on this wider site that really is, is, isn't so much of a fit to the area as the site perhaps could be. Next slide please. Uh, this shows the proposed site layout. It shows the three pairs of semi-detached properties, two stories albeit accommodation in the roof space so you can see the dormer windows to the rear and the single story flat roofed elements to the back as well. Um, so three pairs of semis and you can see the detached property, um, which is unit number five. Thank you. Um, sitting close to a pair of semis. So it's sort of red in connection with those. Um, when you viewed from the street scene, you can see a strip of land to the rear that goes in between two properties on Load Lane. Now, at the moment, there is an access that leads through to the church building and site. Um, that piece of land, though, um, isn't capable of accommodating a house as any part of this redevelopment. Uh, initially, the application did propose a house there, but I'll show you those drawings later on as, and to explain how the, the proposal has uh, changed over time. So in order to secure that piece of land, um, the applicants have stated that it will be run and managed and landscaped and, and carefully set aside. Um, in terms of impact upon neighbours, you can see the relationship with the um, semi-detached properties either side to the bottom of the screen, number 39. Um, yes, the proposal uh, plot seven does extend beyond the rear of that. Howbeit, there are existing extensions and outbuildings on that boundary of number 39 that would screen it. To the north, adjacent to number 25, again, it extends beyond the rear. And yes, there is a breach of the 45 degree line. However, we don't apply rigidly the 45 degree rule to single story extensions and having regard to the separation distance, uh, we, we're, we're content that that's an acceptable impact. You'll also note as well that the houses don't quite sit in line with the frontage properties uh, on Faulkner Road. That's in order to give sufficient parking space and also allow for accommodation or uh, well, general circulation and landscaping as well to help soften the appearance of the properties. So next slide, please. Here we go. That's the street scene. You can see um, the three pairs of semis in the detached house in terms of ridge heights and eave heights. Um, they follow through to the neighboring properties. Um, the roofs are gabled that mirror the gable ended property uh, of number 25 to the left. Um, and although the remainder of the properties to the right as you go along the road are predominantly hipped, dead opposite, there are quite a collection of uh, hipped, I mean, oh, sorry, a gabled roof properties. So within that context, they certainly sit comfortably. In terms of design details, the scheme uh, has been amended uh, several times uh, during the course of, of its lifetime. And you'll see that there are full height uh, bay windows there to replicate those that are commonplace on properties on that side of Faulkner Road. So in terms of its design, we're content that that is a really good fit um, with the existing properties in the street. Next slide, please. Now these are the elevations of the properties, uh, front, rear uh, and sides. You can see the dormer window. That though is in the rear elevation rather than the front. 
Next slide, please. This will be the alternative house type. So the other side of the pair of semis, again, pretty much the same. Nothing more to uh, to point out to you there. Next slide, please. These are the floor plans arranged over three stories. Next slide, please. And the floor plans of the, of the detached uh, property as well, which are pretty much the same. Next slide, please. Now we have a street scene drawing here that shows in connection with the height of properties uh, on Load Lane. Isn't particularly relevant now that the house is not being proposed um, on Load Lane, um, but it shows the height of the new dwellings on Faulkner Road. And as we've already seen from the street scene drawing, the site is pretty much the same as, as what surrounds it. Next slide, please. Now, these are coming on to the schemas that was originally submitted just to show you that the work that's gone in to uh, amend and reduce this site to make it acceptable. Now, you can see there how initially along the site frontage of Faulkner Road, there were seven properties comprising of two pairs of semi-detached properties, with three detached properties in between, and also a, uh, a narrow property proposed fronting load lane between numbers 499 and 503. Um, the next two slides will really show just how they would have looked in the street scene and you'll appreciate why uh, we've gone to great lengths to, to negotiate the changes that we have. So next slide please. Here we go. Um, don't really fit into the street context at all. If you look at the design, um, gable fronting the highway, three storeys for the detached properties, uh, ridge levels, um, eaves levels far higher than what's locally distinct. So as officers, understandably, we had concerns and it's been amended to the scheme that you now see. The next slide will show you the proposed house on Load Lane that was removed, which looks somewhat awkward against those much <laughs> wider and taller properties that do extend for some distance either side of, of this street, uh, of this street scene drawing. So that was not deemed to be acceptable, hence that's been omitted from the scheme. Next slide, please. So we've got some photographs. So that is looking uh, onto the site dead opposite. Um, it has now been boarded up. Um, you can see to the far right there, the church, the church building itself has, has hoardings in front of it. Directly in front of us there was the car park that, that served the church. Next slide, please. Here we go, the church buildings that are being demolished. Uh, they are um, predominantly single story, but you know, with, with, with Lot of space inside, given it's a, uh, a hall to be used for uh, two purposes. Next slide, please. This shows the adjacent property number 25 that has the gabled roof. You'll also see that there is a, 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 a large box dormer to the rear of that property, so they are uh, they do exist in the street to the rear. Next slide, please. Same photo, well, photo of the same property again. Next slide, looking onto the site. Um, that's number 25 to the left. Next slide, please. That's standing in the same position and panning around a little bit to see the church buildings on the opposite side. Now, this is a photo of the load lane frontage, and it's in that gap there behind that hoarding that the house was proposed initially. I have some aerial photographs that pretty much confirm uh, what I said at the start of this presentation how the site sits within um, a high density suburban residential area. You see um, the car park there that the arrow is pointing directly to. We have a few other slides now that show pretty much the same thing, but from different angles. So I'll go fairly quickly through that. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. That's from the load lane side. Next slide, please. This is back on the street, just so in a, a view down towards the junction with Trinity Close. The site application site is on the right. Next slide, please. And back the other way. Location sites on the left. That's the end of the, uh, the slideshow. So the key issue is relevant to the assessment and determination of this application are explored in detail in the main report. And the recommendation is one of approval subject to conditions. But before I end, can I just remind members of the update note that includes an additional informative note relating to the provision of uh, EV charging points? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John, uh, and um, I sincerely hope that the uh, what appeared to be a silver Volkswagen Golf on the uh, the entrance to the load lane, which had four wheels on the pavement, was ticketed. Uh, it's 
Uh, sorry, we do have uh, uh, a statement to be read out, uh, do we not, Mr Acton? Do, Chairman. Thank you. This is a statement from Mrs Dawn Wilkinson. Issues we have with the above application are as follows. Parking. Trinity Close is full of people over the age of 55, which means that ambulances, police and other assistance vehicles, care workers as well, must be able to enter Trinity Close from the bottom to the top. Our own parking can be an issue, with some residents having to rent garages when available, as most days they cannot park their cars. We also have MIND parking in Trinity Close. MIND is now operating until late in the evening. Therefore, issues caused by other par people parking rather than residents will continue later into the evening. There's also a wooden sign from JLR saying that no employee should be parking in or around Trinity Close. We're therefore concerned about extra parking which may be required from employees and contractors for the site at various times, i.e. visitors and if any properties are to be HMOs. Could Trinity Close be marked as parking for residents only, so as to help this situation? We presume that the building company will contact the council regarding the parking restrictions for Faulkner Road as per earlier building work in Faulkner Road. What about the diversity of people moving into these houses? Schooling and doctors, for example. We also have had drugs, theft and criminal damage issues from locals in this area. We would require an agreement that Faulkner Road is left in the correct manner every day after works vehicles have been delivered and repair any damage caused by works. Pathway had been across this land since 1902. And this was very useful to old, older residents going to the bus stops to and from Solly Hall. This will be lost in this application and residents will have to go the long way round. We've also lost our community hall from which we have not yet recovered. That ends the statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ray. It's my responsibility to start the debate. The council standing orders require me to move the motion. Although I'm moving the motion, I'm still undecided on how I will vote. Do I have a second that? Thank you very much. Uh, members, Councillor Caldwell. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, obviously, we've already spoken about this during our briefing. Um, my concern was mainly around, and it's interesting that Mrs. Wilkinson's deputation has mentioned that the pathway's been there since 1902. Um, it, it seems a shame to me that the pathway couldn't be maintained between Low Lane and Faulkner Road, and knowing now what I do about the, um, the demographics of the people that live around there, it seems even more of a shame um, that it can't be kept. Um, I think the concern that I have is that I mean I, I, th I think the development itself is absolutely fine and it should be commended and I would be minded to approve that development that's not a problem my concern is around that pathway or what will happen with that land that is currently a pathway because I think we all agree it's too small for a house to be built on it and um, certainly from what we saw in the slides um, I'm not sure that there can be anything put there that is likely to be in keeping with the other houses on load lane so um i would like to propose a condition that the management company that is looking after that space tells us how they're going to do that so that we can actually hold them to account over i just want you to be very clear uh, the wording of what you suggested i'm not against it but um, it, it, it's just, for me, with the greatest of respect, Councillor Caldwell, it was a bit sort of loose, uh, if I can say that. Uh, it, ne it would need to be a little bit tighter, so I'll, whilst I'm hovering around the room, maybe you'd like to, and I'll come back to you toward the end, if that's all right with you. Uh, John, you want to come back? Let's come back on a couple of points, Chair. The first one's to do with the access. Yes, there is a, uh, a path that leads from Load Lane to the site. It isn't a, a private. It isn't a public right of way, though. It is a private access. So, at any time, with or without this development, the site owner could quite easily stop and withhold access along that route. Um, 
So that is something that we could not seek to preserve as part of this application, hence it doesn't. Uh, in terms of the piece of land itself in between numbers 503 and 499, the applicant has said that um, the piece of land is to be securely fenced and maintained by a management company, but I see no reason uh, at all why we could not put uh, a condition on the commission. And we have a fairly standard condition requiring full details of exactly how it will be secured, how it will be treated, how it will be um, surfaced, etc., and then how it will be maintained and monitored in the future. So we can certainly put that on as an additional condition, Chair. You want to come back, uh, Councillor Corbyn? Well, if I may, just to say that what John's outlined there is much exactly what I was hoping would be outlined. So I'd be happy with the condition. I tend to agree that. with you on that. Councillor Davis. Uh, yes, Chairman, thank you. Uh, now that Councillor Caldwell's looseness has been tightened up, I um, I would like to second his his proposal. Can I just ask a couple of questions? One is in relation to this strip of land at the Load Lane end, the red line obviously is for the boundary, but we wouldn't envisage them taking out right to the back of pavement uh, boarding. We would want that stopping in line with the two properties either side so that they haven't got to look out on that for the next 30 years or, or however it's likely to be. Um, and just one thing, and I'm, I'm fairly sure this is all okay, but I want to ask the question about the footpath that's been there since 1900 and whatever it was. Um, is it, is it, a, it's not a publicly owned footpath, then. it's a privately owned footpath. It doesn't gain any legality in terms of the, the number of years it's been used as a footpath. Aisha? <laughs> I thought I'd give Aisha something, you know. Thank you, Councillor. Um, no, it's privately owned. Uh, thank you, Aisha, and thank you for your work. Uh, Councillor Clements. Thank you. Um, as part of the special conditions, would that include um, provision for any rubbish removal if there's anything dumped and that there? Because as we all know, if it's not council property, anything, that's, uh, <laughs> anything that is dumped has to be looked after by someone and it's not normally the council. So I know that would be a resident issue and that would include if we did have the um, fence in line with the building line. Obviously, they, they need to look after any rubbish that's deposited in what would be like the driveway. Um, and then another question is, um, I didn't actually look to see what kind of um, single or double yellow lines are across the front of the property or proposed properties at the moment. And can we ensure that there's at least single yellow lines there so that people can't just park all the way across the, is it Trinity close opposite? Well, in answer to those questions to do with litter picking, etc. Yeah, that was certainly form part of the um, maintenance and, uh, and upkeep. We can specifically mention that as well. So yeah, that'll take care of that. Uh, in terms of park, um, whether there's yellow lines, etc. on the highway, we can look at some photos and look back. Um, but given the extent of drop curbs that will be forming all of the um, driveways, it would be an offence under the Highways Act for people to block access anyway. Um, so with or without yellow lights, you would not get cars all stacked up on the road blocking um, drives unless they were blocking their own drive. But uh, should we, can we look at some photos? I can have a look without getting it. Um, yes, John, um, particularly the Volkswagen one. I think it's single yellow. I, I will erase a point over that, please. Yeah, single yellow lines run by the site, so during the day at least, people couldn't park there. It's the load lane photograph that I would like to see, uh, please, because I do want to refer to it. Boarding from load lane. The last photo. Yeah.
That's the one. Thank you. Um, members, uh, and I, I tend to agree that we would like that hoarding taken back to the building line. My concern over that is, and welcome your views. Uh, as we heard in the statement from the objector, um, there is JLR parking, and we know ex that is directly opposite JLR, main entrance to JLR. Um, if that hoarding was taken back to the building line, would you have two silver golfs parked there, or maybe even three? That uh, 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 you see where I'm coming from, um, Councillor Butler. Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, in essence, I, I, I fully support this this development. Um, it, it's just thrashing out this this detail regarding that little strip of land, isn't it? And I, I agree with what all my colleagues have said here today. Um, the, the concerns that that I have are, uh, as has been mentioned, the ASB element, the uh, potential for fly tipping, uh, but just thinking about about how we can how we can. Uh, Find a workaround with with the the, the parking issue. Um, could we keep, could we condition or, or or ask for some form of ballarding maybe at the front adjacent to the roadside? You know, just to, to 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 prevent that. I think I think that may deter a certain amount of ASB because when that when that that pathway is if, if that building line is taken back. Um, it, it may be a, 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 an attractive place for for people to, shall we say, to, to, uh, just a thought. Come back on that, Chair. There's there's all sorts of ways that that area could be treated. Certainly, with any scheme to be submitted, we would need to know exactly the means of boundary treatment. And yes, I would expect to see any substantial uh, boundary treatment pushed back no further than the front of the houses. Then there's the issue of how is the, the exposed open element dealt with. There's all sorts of ways. It, it could be ballard. It could be through landscaping. Suitable landscaping of the right height and species can certainly deter um, people uh, in those areas. And don't forget, of course, we'll have an upkeep and maintenance uh, element to the scheme as well. So it, it could that, that could perhaps be the better way to treat it. You want to come back, Councillor Butler? Please, thank you. And I, I'm glad I, I raised that because I, I think some, uh, you know, some some basic landscaping at the foot there would, would solve that problem and also make it a little bit more uh, pleasing on the eye. But thank you, members. Um, are you happy that uh, officers uh, write up that uh, extra condition? If so. Uh, Vote the uh, the application is recommended for approval subject to conditions with the addition of a further condition that uh, Mr. Hallam will draft. Um, are those in favour? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Unanimous, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Therefore, we move on to agenda item 18, which is the uh, appeals report. And as you can see from that, we have been successful uh, in um, getting those appeals dismissed. Did you want to comment? Did anybody want to comment on those, John? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, just very briefly, the Herdis Road appeal was an enforcement appeal where uh, an extension in a very prominent position on the site frontage had been built without planning permission. An enforcement notice was served, the enforcement notice was appealed against, and rightfully so, the inspector dismissed the appeal, noting the harmful impact on, on the street scene, particularly by virtue of the way it extended significantly beyond the established building line. So that's the first one. The second one is a slightly larger development, the Hobbs Remote Road site, that was for the demolition of a pair of semi-detached dwellings and the erection in its place, or in their place rather, of a 20 apartment block of flats. Quite a big building. It was quite a modern contemporary flat roof design, up to three storeys in places. Um, and it was dismissed due to its harmful impact upon the character of the area. 
um, and also um, due to its harmful impact upon residential amenity, particularly due to the location of a bin store in close proximity to houses and the amount of properties, 20, that would be using it. Although the application was refused as well due to a harmful impact uh, of net biodiversity on the site, that element of the appeal was not upheld, so it was dismissed for the two reasons of uh, impact on character and residential amenity. A very, very good decision. Thank you, John. Uh, and uh, finally, we come to the last item on the agenda, delegated decisions. Um, are we happy just to note those? Therefore, we may well have set a record tonight because that uh, concludes this evening's planning committee. Thank you very much, and uh, it's a relatively early night for a change.